Next up, we have Defending Cyberspace by Thinking Inside the Box by Ernest Wong. Please give him a warm Torcom welcome. Thank you, Rivers. I appreciate it. Uh, just a quick show of hands. Uh, any military folks or ex-military in the audience? Uh, would you mind telling me a branch of service? Army. Army? Marines. Marines, OK. Marines, no Navy, no Air Force folks? I was going to give a plug to the Navy folks, because since we're in San Diego, I know there's a lot of Navy. I'll give a plug for them anyway. My brother's in the Navy, so it's actually uh, Army-Navy games aren't that bad either way. Um, my talk is uh, really getting uh, our military leadership to start thinking outside the box uh, for cyber defense. I know the title says thinking inside the box, but it's really trying to give creativity to our military folks. So what, for everyone else in here, hopefully this gives you a framework for just thinking about innovation in a more structured way that helps you all in your, your lives, your own lives, and uh, maybe for your company. And uh, as I go through this presentation, I'll introduce myself as I go through the presentation, because what I found was that uh, with the keynote speech that uh, Lance gave this morning, a lot of similarities I, I saw myself with him. I've only been in the cyber, cyber business for two years now, so this is my very first TorCon. Uh, very happy uh, to be in San Diego. Uh, my brother spent eight years of his military service here in San Diego, got a chance to visit him coming from Los Angeles. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here in San Diego. Um, and before I get really started on talking about this notion of innovation, thinking inside the box, uh, not a whole lot of military folks in the audience. I'm hazarding guess that not a low, whole lot of folks are familiar with the Army Cyber Institute. And so CNET did this nice video, about a three minute video, let's hopefully it works. Gives a little background on West Point itself where I teach and where the Army Cyber Institute's located at, at the think tank. Oh, okay, it's coming through this. Yeah, okay. So. Yeah, it's kind of light, but uh, I'll try to narrow it a little bit then. It's. So each year, the NSA hosts this cyber defense exercise, and all the military academies participate in it. And cadets are working on it. It's a cyber defense uh, team. It's an elective. Really, it's a. Uh, extracurricular club that these uh, cadets are involved in. Each year about four of our research scientists at the Army Cyber Institute help out with uh, oversee, administrate, uh, coordinate this uh, exercise. So that's my boss, Colonel Andy Hall is my boss.
So I am uh, very fortunate to be working in the Army Cyber Suit. I've been there two and a half years now. Um, before then, I, and I mentioned that at the very start, that I'm pretty much just a basic, before, before then I was just a basic user, uh, right? Getting the annual training for the military folks, you know, the online training, the hour-long online training it tells you what you can and can't do uh, with uh, what you do on your computers and cell phones and tablets. And uh, so I see the flawed system in a lot of our ed education system for our military soldiers. And uh, what we try to do in the ACI is promote this notion of multidisciplinary research to solve this challenge known as cybersecurity. And um, my take on it is that this notion of innovation, I, I actually don't think innovation as this one monolithic entity. I break it up. Uh, so a little bit about what Lance mentioned this morning in the keynote speech, talking about being innovative and being disruptive. That's really what I want our military to be in terms of cyber defense as well. And so instead of looking at innovation as this one entity, I've broken it out into several distinctions. First, on one axis, I'm looking at the technological sophistication or complexity of that innovation itself. On the other axis, I'm breaking it up into the target mark, this innovation, uh, technology, uh, device, whatever we want to call it, is trying to, trying to target. So if we look on this lower uh, left-hand quadrant here, this notion of being a low complexity targeting existing markets, I call this sustaining types of in innovation. Uh, we can think a lot of companies, right, they change the colors, they're trying to attract more market share. Though that's why I'm thinking of sustaining innovation, meeting existing customer needs, but just trying to grow the business. For the high complexity, but still targeting existing markets, I call this evolutionary innovation, right? Darwin talked about, right, all you're trying to do is with evolution, right? It's the mix that gets you to be one species above some other species. And so this is the notion of incremental types of innovation. Now, when we get to new markets and high technology or high complexity, I call that breakthrough types of innovation. Governments tend to be pretty good at this. I'm thinking DARPA, NASA, a lot of government agencies tend to be good at this. Now, what about this thing, right? Low complexity, but new markets. Okay. I'm calling that revolutionary or disruptive types of innovation. Right? Hopefully, a lot of the stuff that we've been hearing uh, throughout the day, and hopefully tomorrow we'll be hearing a lot really on the, what I call revolution disruptive innovations. The problem I see here though is, unfortunately, right, most, uh, I would say most people in the military, most people in the military, from what I've encountered, don't think of revolutionary sustaining innovations as being innovative, right? They're fixated on this high complexity, right? A AI, we saw it in that video, right? Machine learning. The military likes automating all this stuff because we tend to be a smaller military compared to right, the Chinese and Russian militaries that have a lot of soldiers. So in this case, a lot of military folks and even some, right, some people think innovations can only be high tech. Okay? Well, hopefully that's not the case for the folks in this audience. Right? Most hackers, I think most hackers, tend to think otherwise. Most hackers, actually, I would hopefully would agree in this room, revolutionary sustaining innovations are innovations in themselves. Hacks, hacks in themselves, right? We talk about hacks, that's a revolutionary innovation. It right? doesn't cost a whole lot of money, it doesn't take a lot of research and development, okay? So hopefully that's what I'm gonna convince you for the next uh, 45 minutes here. Okay, I'm a military intelligence officer, and so uh, when I think of military intelligence, I told you I could give you a little background as, as this presentation goes on. The way I think of these innovations, and then the analogies I use, it comes from Hollywood, right? Hollywood has given me some, some nice little cheap uh, mnemonics or memory uh, mechanisms to think of each of these types of, uh, these separate quadrants. So when I think of sustaining innovations, I'm thinking Spock. Okay, I'm, I'm a Star Trek fan. I am a Star Wars fan, I'm also a Star Trek fan. So I'm thinking Spock, right? Spock is very logical. Right? He's gonna give Captain Kirk the, the course of action that has the highest probability of success, even if it means his own life. And I guess that was uh, Wrath of Khan, so Star Wars 2, is that what it was? So he's gonna give the, the best course of action based on the available information. So I'm thinking that's sort of the sustaining efficiency gains, right, so thinking Spock. On the evolutionary side, any Mad Magazine fans or still remember Mad Magazine? You might remember Spy versus Spy, okay? So that's really what I think of evolutionary, right? For the white spy versus the black spy, they're trying to kill each other, right? So, but all they're doing is trying to one-up each other. And that's this whole notion of evolution. On the breakthrough side, I am thinking James Bond, right? James Bond has the entire resources of MI6, 
the entire British wealth, I guess whatever it is after what was left, I, I guess, whatever they can say after the, uh, the Brexit, I guess that's still in place. But anyway, James Bondian types of innovation, right? He's always got the watch, the car, the plane, whatever that saves the day, right? Disarms the news. But what about this revolutionary side? Do we have any examples of revolutionary Hollywood icons? Someone mentioned it earlier this morning. Right? MacGyver? Yeah, well, American versus British, that's kind of a nice way to think of this too, right? MacGyver, he's got his trusty, what is it? He's always using his uh, Swiss Army knife. I watched MacGyver last night for the first time. I mentioned this to Aaron earlier. I couldn't stay awake long enough to finish it. I'm on East Coast time. Uh, so it was, I think it was on at nine o'clock. But he, I did see him with the Swiss Army knife. When I saw that, I said, all right, I'm on the right track. I cut, them, cut the show. I don't need to see him anymore. But uh, for the audience, no, no, everyone's familiar with, yeah, I'm pulling this audience now. I think everyone should be familiar with MacGyver or the new MacGyver. Any thumbs up or thumbs down on the new MacGyver? Anyone watching it? Thumbs down? I saw two people in the promo. I thought MacGyver was just one person, so I'll have to figure that out. Um, if now, if you're not familiar with MacGyver, depending on the audience, I think everyone here should be familiar with MacGyver. But if you're not familiar with MacGyver, you should be familiar with Jason Bourne. Okay, so Jason Bourne, right, he's using all the tricks of the trade. Right, he doesn't remember that he got all this training. But, uh, right, he's driving the Mini Coupe, the old Mini Coupe. He's, right, using a, a stick to beat up the cops. He's using a pen, right? He's using whatever has his fingertips to, uh, to save the day. Usually it's saving his own life. Now, one of these is not a good military intelligence type of analogy, right? Yeah, it's, it's not, yeah, Spock doesn't really belong here. I told you I'm a Star Trek fan, but Spock really doesn't belong here, right? Because if we're talking about military intelligence, folks, we're thinking about spies, right? I really am not thinking about mission, I'm thinking Mission Impossible here, but I'm not thinking of Tom Cruise Mission Impossible, right? Because this is the episode where I think it was uh, Rogue Nation where he's climbing the highest tower, right? The Burj Khalif, one of those, the towers in, in, uh, in the United Arab Emirates, right? With that glove, right? That's a high tech equipment, right? That's a lot of R&D, if it were really real, right? A lot of R&D, right? It had glitches, right? Powers off a few times, but uh, that's breakthrough types of innovation. What I'm thinking, right, for sustaining is, if you remember Mission Impossible, the original, right? The black and white, it was in color. Right, Paris, right? Leonard Nimoy played Paris. And for Mission Impossible, right, their tricks of the trade were the skills that they had available to them. So Spock spoke like 10 different languages. In reality, it was just different pronunciations of English, right? It's just various, so we can all understand it. But I remember watching one episode where he played this Japanese ambassador and he was making out like he spoke Japanese. So, but usually he's playing some type of East, Eastern European type of general. Um, so again, but that was really for all the MI, right? The MI forces, the impossible military forces, they were doing sustaining types of innovation. They were the best at what they were doing, right? That's what was the very first sequence. You pick the best people you have with the skills you need. You play the con on, on this unsuspecting nation. Now, if you are a Mission Impossible fan, I am gonna, Yes, you, you hear in the background here. Again, I told you, this is San Diego. I'm going to play up the Navy, folks. Can anyone hear that? Well, I'm going to play it. Right, here we go. Yeah, so you should, right, if you're a Tom Cruise fan, I'm not going to leave you out. Tom Cruise was a little bit revolutionary. And what movie is this? Top Gun. Top Gun. Top Gun. Fighter pilots. How can the heck they, can they be uh, revolutionary? Well... This whole notion is that, I'll leave it on since it's, it's uh, in, uh, the, in the Vietnam War, the U.S. pilots suffered so many casualties. Um, uh, here's, here's statistics. About a, for a million sorties from uh, 1965 to 1968, a million U.S. sorties, Air Force, Navy, uh, U.S. suffered about a thousand uh, plane losses. That was the the U.S. forces did not like that. And so we actually stopped bombing from 68 to 69, trying to figure out how to get our bombers to survive more, even our fire planes. So what the Navy did, the Navy, they had, right, they did this report, got all these statistics. The Navy said, we need to train our pilots better. 
we're going to get this school called right, the school called right, it's called the Fire Weapon School. They called it Top Gun, right? That's what the movie. This was actually from the intro of the movie. I had to go back and watch the movie. Yeah, oh, they actually did do this, right? In March of 1960. 1969, the U.S. Navy established this school. The Air Force, what did the Air Force do? They went the route of the breakthrough. Okay. So the Air Force went the route of the breakthrough. They said, we need better weapon systems. We need an aircraft. At the time, it was the uh, F-4 Phantom uh, fighting against the Russian MiG-17s uh, and MiG-21s. Okay. Um, it was pretty much parody uh, from 65 to 68 parody. We shot down as many Russian planes as they shot down of ours. So that, that's why they stopped those runs, the bombing campaigns plus the flights. Uh, the US military said, we can't do this. We can't sustain uh, our rates of sorties against the Russian hordes, because they had so many more pilots, so many more planes. And so the Navy went revolutionary. They said, we're going to start the school and figure out the techniques that makes our, make our pilots better. The Air Force went the route of better planes, better weapon systems, improve the F-4 Phantoms, and amazing, this is uh, uh, from a book called uh, Transforming the American Air Power by Benjamin Lambeth. He's, this is amazing. The kill ratio for US pilots to Russians prior to the start of the school was 3.7 to 1. So for every one American pilot, we shot down 3.7 Russian pilots. That's pretty good, right? But we couldn't sustain that uh, over time. Uh, that's what the, uh, after the school was in place for one year, when they reintroduced the fighting campaign over Vietnam, for the Navy, they went to a ratio of, this is amazing, 13 to 1. So the pilots who went through, again, it wasn't every single pilot, but the pilots who went through this uh, four or five week long course, at that time it was a six week long course, they improved their skills so much because they're fighting against, right, they're fighting against tactics that the Russians are using, right? If you remember the movie, Viper and Jester. They were the op four, the opposing forces, right? That's what they did. They introduced Russian tactics. But the amazing thing, here's the, here's the crazy thing about history. I told you, uh, the Air Force, they went breakthrough. They actually, the Navy actually all used a lot of principles from this uh, colonel from the Air Force called John Boyd. He invented this notion called OODA loops, this notion of orient, observe, orient, decide, uh, assess. That's what the Navy was doing throughout that course. Right. See what the Navy pilot's doing, see what your opponent's doing, observe it, orient towards it, assess what he's doing, and then make, make some type of decision that gives you some type of advantage. If you can do it faster than the enemy, that's even better. You get in their OODA loop. The Air Force, their statistics, they had about the same starting off, about a three, three to one. After the introduction of new, new uh, uh, firepower into the F-4s, new boost systems, uh, in 1969, the statistics were that year, that was the first year the Air Force actually stats went down. It went down to 2.9 to 1. So very statistically, no improvement. So from a 3 to 1 to a 13 to 1 ratio for the Navy to a 3 to 1 to a 3 to 1 for the, or, uh, for the Air Force. Again, pretty powerful statistics for an anecdote for uh, disruptive types of invasion. Now, I'm not saying that breakthrough is bad, right? Air Force does great things doing new generations of fighters, but it takes a lot of time. In one year span, they couldn't do it for, for Vietnam. So this, not, this notion of looking at this, this quadrant system for innovation, right? This is not from a mathematical perspective, right? This notion is I don't have any numbers here. Any business majors in the audience? Business school? Yeah, you can sure break the world, right? Business school, they tell you you can break the world in four quadrants all the time. I'm not a big fan of that because there's no numbers, right? Where the heck's my scale? Right? So in this case, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of scale. So, so let's give you a little bit of scale by introducing one more axis. This notion called offset potential or possibility of impact, disruption. That's what uh, Lance talked about, Lance Reams talked about this morning. Okay, if we look at this offset potential now, one more axis, right? I'm, now this graph changes. Revolutionary and breakthrough innovations, those are the ones that give us the best probability of changing the environment. Sustaining and evolutionary in innovations don't do that, right? The highest probability of success for impacting change in the environment comes from revolutionary and breakthrough types of innovation. 
Now again, I still don't have numbers here, right? I don't have numbers, but this is probably a more representative way of this, that this graph looks if I add this offset potential. Now if I change this offset potential and now call it probability success, we should already know what it looks like, right? Now, it's probably a success that these innovations actually succeed. Yeah, then it's sustaining evolutionary innovations that actually have, have, have the highest chance, right? But if you look at, right, all the business books, right, all the CEOs are writing take, take chances, uh, make mistakes. They're not saying make mistakes with these types of innovations. If you're doing sustaining an ev uh, evolutionary types of innovation, you should be getting 60, 70, 80, 90% success rates. They're thinking revolutionary breakthrough, right? But no one's ever quantified that so everyone thinks of innovation as one lot of any innovation. No, I'm telling you, you need to be taking revolutionary breakthrough innovations if you truly are following the, the advice of all these business, right, these business moguls are say, telling you, take, take chances, take risks. They're telling you, make those mistakes in the revolutionary and breakthrough side. Okay, so this is really what it would look probably more representational if I add this in, this third axis for probably success. Okay, again, I have no numbers here, right, again, as a systems engineer, I teach systems engineering and in addition to working in the Army Cyber Institute as a research scientist, I teach systems engineering uh, to cadets at West Point. And again, I tell them they have to quantify certain things, not just quali qualitative analysis, but they have to quantify analysis as well. So I used, right, this notion called the Arab Revolt, the Green Revolt, the Arab Spring that took place from uh, 2010, 2011. It was amazing, right? This is kind of like a nice case study it started off with, uh, in December of uh, uh, 2010, right? A street vendor set himself on fire because the Tunisian police confiscated his vegetables, right? He was a street uh, peddler of vegetables. And so he took away his livelihood. I don't know what the reason was, but because of that, the vendor set himself on fire, right? Immolated himself. And that sparked along with this whole notion of social media, Right uh, at that time, WikiLeaks came out with this report of all these corrupt governments, a lot of them in the Middle East, North, uh, uh, Middle East, North Africa, right? From our intelligence sources, State Department cables. Yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't very good. So a lot of, right, 13 other countries revolted pretty much in, within the next six months. So revolts. Anyone, rem anyone remember how many of these revolts actually succeeded? Tunisia was one. So where it first started, that government fell. Egypt, the king there was deposed. Yeah, we have someone saying sort of, sort of, sort of so. Hold on to that thought. We have Yemen, uh, uh, Yemen, Yemen, Yemen the, the king fled. There's still a lot of fighting there, right? The king fled, so the revolt succeeded, but there's still a lot of fighting, infighting between groups. So you might debate whether or not that's success. And we had Libya. Right, Libya fell, Gaddafi, right, two years later we killed him, or at least we didn't kill him, we, uh, some rebels killed him, we captured it on film. Right. So yeah, we had someone say, yeah, so-so for Egypt. Yeah, I don't really call that a revolution, it started off as a revolution, but who took over in Egypt? The military took over, so that was a military coup, right? It started off as a revolution, but the, within a few days it was the military that actually took over the government. And so if we look at these, Statistics, right? I don't consider military coups uh, revolutionaries, right? Because military, I'm in the military, right? The military has the resources to overtake a government. That's why when you talk about inefficiencies in the government, I look at this and tell, yeah, we learn from the Romans, right? The Americans learn from the Romans. It's not good to have a large standing army, right, with nothing to do, standing by a government that's probably not doing a great job, right? The public poll is saying the president's polls are so much and Congress's polls are even worse. You really don't want to have a military uh, in the states when that happens. So again, so just to tell you, just to give you an anecdote how inefficient the government is. I've been in the military for 22 years. I've moved 11 times. The average is three years for an assignment. I took a lot of one-year assignments, so the average. Uh, so again, that's a lot of inefficiencies. A lot of inefficiencies with our cybersecurity program. That's why I'm trying to uh, promote this, this talk here. Uh, trying to get our government leaders to think of, again, new ways of thinking of this. So again, that's statistics. 21% uh, chance of successful revolutions, and that's just looking at uh, this as a case study. That's actually pretty good. I would have thought, I would have thought it would have been in single digits for, uh, that, if I were just throw a number in. Again, using this case study, about 20% successful revolutions. 
Okay, so now I can use numbers, right? I can use probability about 20%. But again, Hollywood, right? This whole notion of Hollywood. Again, the Star Wars fans, who are my Star Wars fans here? Right? Hollywood gives us this notion that revolutions are easy, right? And, and then uh, by, by, uh, by uh, associative theory, then breakthroughs are easy, right? Yeah, we have this notion of, right? Not just Star Wars. We have Rogue One, the, the prequel to Star Wars. Ah, oh, revolutions are easy, right? People died in those those movies, but it happens, right? We can we can fight the force, we can fight the empire. The problem is, the problem is, on the right, once Darth Vader gets hold of what's going on with this revolution, yeah. right? The evolutionary side, the spy versus spy. He's going to try to wipe out that revolution. And he can, right? What does he do? What does Darth Vader use? What does Darth Vader use? He uses the breakthrough, right? From his evolutionary side, he comes up with the Death Star. I, I'm not going to take care of these rebels one at a time. I'm going to use the Death Star. If I think there's a rebel on that planet, I'm taking the whole planet out. That's a, that's a breakthrough type of innovation, right? It takes a long time, right? It took a long time for them to build the Death Star. Right, the rebels brought the plans and actually thwarted one of them, but right, breakthrough innovations. Yeah, once you have one, you can start making more. Okay. Okay, so this notion of revolutionary innovation, and also instead of thinking just the quadrant system, I also think of it in uh, in terms of timeline as a timeline. So the person that I, the persons that actually came up with this timeline, this framework here, are Joseph Christensen and I'm I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Joseph Bauer and Clayton Christensen, a couple of Harvard Business School professors. And the way we were looking at this, right, it's color code still, right, so we have sustaining and evolutionary innovations. Again, it is making progress over time, but incremental, right, very small. So if we look at breakthrough, it's jumping above the line. That's why I call it, my subtitle for breakthrough innovation is jumping the curve. It's jumping what the market expects of some type of device, technology, equipment, whatever it is. On the revolutionary side, yeah, so Christian Bauer, they actually studied this notion. The failure of leading companies, right, companies on this green line, to stay at the top of their industries when technologies and markets change. How is that even possible, right? If you're on this green line, that is a great place to be, right? You're almost like a monopoly power if you're on this green line. We dominate the market. Why would these small rebels, insurgents, whatever we call them, upstarts, right, in the, in, uh, in the business parlance, why would these upstarts ever bother us, right? We can compete with them on, on every level. Well, this notion of revolutionary innovations, uh, and then Christian and Sinan Bauer talk about this specifically, is that uh, uh, revolutionary innovations only appeal to a small set uh, of new markets. Right? Talk about that, that quadrant system. It's really um, an emerging market. Initially, it's really for the individual, right? As hackers, we make hacks because it suits our lives. But it focuses on a different set, right? That, that criteria that's so important to that individual is not what the folks on the green line are thinking of. Right? The folks on the green line are thinking of things that improve their current customers. <laughs> Typically, their current customers are the big customers, right? We want the biggest market share. That, isn't that what they teach us in business school? Right? We don't care about the small margins. Let the small margins go to the competitors. They can have that market segmentation. We want the big customers, our most profitable co customers. For the revolutionary innovation, though, it is far worse in at least one or two areas, usually a lot of areas, but it's far worse in at least one or two mainstream areas. But the notion is that if it's successful, the value criteria, which the guys in green are, are ignoring, right, it gains such a, a attraction that uh, folks keep buying it to the expense of the guys in green. They've, they've missed that opportunity. Can we think of examples of that, this in history, in business? Xerox versus Canon. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to come up to that. Good, hold that thought. What, what about Xerox versus, what did Canon do to Xerox? Everyone remember Xerox? Yeah, Xerox used to have print divisions, right? They sold these monsters that would probably fit in half this room, especially like universities, large corporations, IBMs, the, themselves. Yeah, Canon, Canon specifically, who, who did Canon target? They, they target the home base business. Yeah. Right, Canon came up with this copier that could fit on your desktop, right? The desktop printer. Terrible, right? Xerox laughed at Canon when it first came out because the quality was terrible. 
right? Xerox is on the green line. They laughed at Canon, right? Another example, IBM versus Apple. Right? Same thing. IBM laughed at Apple when they came up with that, right? The two, it's, we saw it this morning. Xerox. Xerox and Apple. That's yeah. Well, well, you know, you all, well, I'm in a room of hackers, right? But we all know the history, right? Everyone's seen the movie Jobs, right? Jo Steve Jobs and Wozniak. Those are the two, two Apple folks that are really famous. There are two other guys in the garage. No one talks about them. Guess where they came from? They came from Xerox. The two other scientists that were in the garage with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, they came from Xerox. Xerox did not approve those two uh, inventors, those two uh, technicians, plan for a personal computer. So those two guys quit Xerox, jumped on board Steve Jobs. It's Xerox, right? Xerox Park used to be the engineering, uh, Xerox Park's still around, but it used to be where, if you were an engineer, that's where you wanted to go. And these two smart, right, enthusiastic engineers said, hey, we have this great idea, right? Target, instead of mainframes, let's target it for, right, home-based business. They said, no, nah, that's uh, non-competitive, right? Margin is too low, right? we don't like that. But uh, someone else mentioned auto industry. This was a shock, though. This was not a market uh, reaction. It was a shock to the system. 1979, what happened to gas prices? Yeah, they went through the roof, right? And doubled really overnight because of the Iranian embargo with the, the whole notion of the, uh, was the uh, hostage crisis that we had. They, they closed down what? Which company is this? Okay, yeah, I'm not aware of that, but uh, this whole notion of, why did folks gravitate towards these Japanese companies? What was the one feature that they had? Fuel cost, right? Fuel efficiency, right? The, the, the big three, they focused on big engines, right? A lot of accelerations, uh, big vehicles, right? That's what Americans wanted, right? So they, they, they catered to the American customer. But with the oil shock, right, all of a sudden, the criteria that became valued, right, a different set of criteria, it was not quality initially, right? We think of Toyota, Hondas, the Subarus as being high quality today. Initially, it was not quality. It was fuel efficiency. As they moved up the curve, right, as the Hondas, right, they kept selling more cars. As they, Then they started to compete with the big three on quality as well, surpassing them in some instances. Yeah. Now, who's competing against Toyotas and Hondas today? From a, from a, do you think Tesla's more on the red side or more on the blue side? I think Tesla's more on the blue side, right? A lot, very expensive, a lot of R&D. So who's competing with? Yeah, the Hyundais, the Kias. It used to be the Daewoo's, but they sort of fell out. I remember, I told you, probably a success, right? 20%, 30%, major league bagging average. But Kia's competing against uh, the uh, Kia and Hyundai. They're competing against Toyota. You know, the exact same model. That's why Clayton, Clayton and uh, Clayton Christians and Joseph Bauer study this. It's amazing, right? Now the Toyotas and the Hondas, they've made it to the green line, and now we have the upstarts again, the uh, Hyundais and the Kias. It's the same company, really, it's a subsidiary of one another. Who's competing with Kia and Hyundai now? We're gonna see this again, possibly. Tata, where's Tata being made? India, what about a, a Chinese company? There's a company called Cherry. Possibly, we don't know, right? The Tatas of India, the Cherries of China, they're competing on this lower end, right? The smaller vehicles. But again, we'll see, right? Again, 30% success rates at best that I'm talking about. But it's amazing that this, this uh, cycle keeps repeating itself. And it's not just car industries, right? It's disc industry, right? The, the floppy drive disc industry, the, uh, the drive space industry, it's the same thing. Western Digital, Seagate, all those, very similar. What about something more recent? Anyone still have a BlackBerry? <laughs> I have it, I have a BlackBerry. The government gave me a BlackBerry. I told you inefficiencies, right? The government gave me a BlackBerry. They have their own smartphone now, but uh, at the height, remember when President Obama was using, the, they called it the CrackBerry? 21%, I think about 21, 22%, uh, BlackBerry RIM had the uh, share of the market share. You know what they have now? about 1%. It's gonna to be tough for them to break out of this, this cycle now. 
Right. What was the feature that uh, the iPhones had, the Androids? What was that one feature? There was apps, but uh, did anyone remember any, anyone over 70 using a BlackBerry? What was that? That was the feature of the BlackBerry, right? What was the feature of the BlackBerry? The, the keyboard, right? It was the keyboard, right? The keypad, right? So we always saw President Obama typing really fast, and they'd have races with the guys on a keypad versus Morse. And then, so it really was the keypad. So the iPhone said, yeah, let's get rid of the keypad. Right? We don't need it. And guess who they targeted? It was where the, their feature was simplicity. Right? Apps was one, so it made, made it tailorable, customizable. But the simplicity, right? We started seeing grandparents. We started seeing little kids with, uh, I never saw a grandparent with a Blackberry. Right? Not because of dexterity. I think it was just because of, yeah, just so foreign. But again, a lot of folks are using iPhones and Android. But again, I'm still using Blackberry again. Partially because of government. Um, but again, I just want to remind yourselves, like based, even if you're looking at it from a timeline, again, more failures than success, right? About 20, 30%. Same thing with revolutionary. Just want to highlight that more failures than success. But it's okay. It's okay if we recognize this in advance. Let's see. Okay, so how can you best protect the future? I've advocated thinking about disruptive innovations and, and revolutionary innovations in this talk, but we have to really do all four, right? The reality is I want to be doing all four innovations, especially for the government sector. The government sector does really need about thinking about all four. The problem is I think we think too much about breakthrough. The government's fascinated with breakthrough innovations. But here's the risk of not thinking about disruptive, right? If you, if we aren't thinking about disruptive, let's take a look at, again, military history. So let's look at the wars where we either didn't lose or lost, right? You can debate that. Let's start with the Korean War. General MacArthur, right, we actually defeated the North Koreans. We pushed the North Koreans, General MacArthur and the UN forces, they pushed the uh, North Koreans all the way back up to the Chinese border, right? Then these pesky, right, Chinese volunteers, right? They're a million, a million man army volunteers. It, it wasn't a million man army at first. It was, uh, at first they thought it was estimates of, 20,000, 30, uh, 200,000, 300,000 Chinese across the uh, border. This is about the October, November time frame, 1953. The problem that MacArthur had, breakthrough innovations, right? MacArthur, 19, what is this now? 19, anyone remember when it started? 19, 1950, is it 1953? Yeah, 1953, June of 1953, okay, after World War II. What was the big invention for if you're a spy? These are on airplanes. U2, the U2 wasn't quite ready yet, but wet film photography, right? So MacArthur relied on wet film photography. What's the drawback of wet film? Light, you need, you need daylight, right? You need, uh, you need light. Wet film photography, right? right? Photography, you need light. So whether or not the Chinese volunteers figured this out, they operate exclusively at night under penalty of being shot, right? The captains were told to shoot folks who, who maneuver during the daytime. So the, the, again, intelligence officer, we call it the two, right? The two is the intel officer in the military unit. Uh, MacArthur's J2 consistently underestimated the Chinese military strength by a factor of 10. You can mess it up by a factor of three and still get away. Consistently throughout the war, he underestimated the Chinese strength by a factor of 10. You can't win a ground force if you're underestimating your enemy by a factor of 10. That is difficult to do. Um, so I'm actually surprised his J-2 never got fired. What about the Vietnam War? Again, I talked a little bit about this earlier, but this is a different aspect. We, the U.S. forces, bombed the heck out of this thing called the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Right, we tried to stop the supply lines, right? It, it went through the Cambodia, through Laos, but really, this notion of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, right, it was causing us problems, right? How are these Vietnamese, Viet Cong rebels, right, bandits, how are they getting uh, Soviet weapon systems that could shoot down, right, our helicopters, that could shoot down, right, could blow away our tanks? So we bombed the heck out of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. What's the problem with bombing the Ho Chi Minh Trail? Well, yeah, the, the, this notion was the Ho Chi Minh Trail, we didn't figure out, it was not initially depend on infrastructure, no road networks, right? No rail networks. It was dismounted infantry. You can bomb the heck out of a forest, and what do the people do? When you see a crater, you go around it. That's what happened initially throughout the war, right? We, there's Ho Chi Minh Trail, right? All these supply lines, we know where the, the, the concentration is. So we bombed the heck out of it, and we thought that would stop it. Ah. 
walked around the craters, right? If you're, you're Viet Cong. So that was the problem with the Vietnam War. Iraq and Afghanistan, major killer for US forces. Improvised explosive device, improvised, right? It's even in the name. It's a disruptive type of innovation, right? Uh, I was stationed in Iraq for a year, right? It's old, uh, they call it unexploded ordnance out there. They, we used to have a, a placard in our vehicles to call the EOD units, right? Hurt Locker, those uh, explosive ordnance uh, detachments. You call them in and they'll get rid of them. There were so many in the area where we were at, right? It didn't make sense to do that. I don't know why we even had that in our vehicles. It was like, right, this makes no sense. Right, government, efficiency. We have this placard that tells us to do that. They're all over the place. And so initially, a lot of the EODs are made from remnants of the Iran Iraq war, right? Just 60 millimeter mortar tubes. They're duds, right? Essentially dudded, but oh, they picked up and maybe it might still explode. And so that's what it was. Did they get better? Yeah, over time, right? They used copper plates, uh, they used other things, but then they started using, right, electronic triggers, right? So, you know, like cell phones. They got better over time, but uh, initially a lot of passive IEDs, right? Command detonators, right? You stepped on it, blew up. A lot of stuff from Vietnam again, right? Came from that. What about cyber warfare? My contention is that nearly all and newly discovered malware, the very first time, comes from the disruptive realm. Right? You might debate me on that, but that's my contention. That's why I'm telling these generals. Right? Most malware uh, discovered for the first time originates in this disruptive space. Right? So we need to be thinking about this disruptive uh, revolutionary space. Okay, so I say, okay, it originates, right? Most malware originates in this revolutionary space, the top left quadrant. But again, there are sustaining evolutionary, right? Version 2.1, version 2.0, as, as it goes on. And again, there's not a whole lot of breakthrough malware, right? There's not a need for it, okay? Sure, there's some, right? Stuxnet, I'm thinking, right? We don't know who supposedly released it. I can't tell you, right? I can't confirm or deny who released it. But if you watch the movie Zero Days, right? Intimated that the Israel, the US, so you have to make that, that citation, right? It's not from the US government citation, it's from the movie Zero Days. Um, but if you look at cyber defense, here's the problem with cyber defense. Yeah, a whole lot of breakthroughs. Yeah, we have at least evolutionary sustaining. Not a whole lot of revolutionary types of innovation for defense, except from this room. That's why I love coming to these conventions. I'm hearing about disruptive innovations for disruptive defense from this room. Sec DevOps, right? That is disruptive. If you're using tools that you have available, think MacGyver. Just a new way of putting your people together to get more security, right? That's, you're not training them any better. You're not using newfangled technology. You're just putting people together to talk or have aftermind, right? This notion of tabletop exercises for cyber defense. You're just putting people together. It's amazing when you put people together, right? Things happen. You talk, communicating. You find out what the weaknesses are. But just by communicating in, together in tabletop exercises, to me, that's disruptive innovation. It doesn't take a whole lot of AI, machine learning, right? That takes a lot of time. So when I see this as a military intelligence officer, I'm seeing a gap. There's a gap here between what there is in cyber offense and what there is for cyber defense, right? This whole notion of we're, we're, we're not doing enough, uh, really, on defense, not enough revolutionary types of uh, focus for cyber defense. Now, so if you agree with me on that premise, we're not doing enough cyber defense, revolutionary cyber defense, right? I just want to reiterate that again, it's tough to do. It is okay, it's tough to do. That's why our military just needs to know that beforehand. It's tough to do breakthrough innovations, right? Success rates probability wise, same. So you might as well do them both, right? Independent. Now, if you really do think you have a way to do disruptive uh, defense, right? This is what I recommend. You want to counter early. That's, we're a little late for that now, right, though, <laughs> with the uh, amount of malware in place and really the vulnerabilities that we have with our systems. The last, the last uh, point there is being an early adopter of chronic experimentation is probably the best way of doing disruptive or revolutionary types of innovation. So if you want to encourage it, this is what you want to do. Experiment, right? This, we learn about experimentation in, uh, in grade school, right? Experiment. Jot down the results. Figure out your control group. Figure out your experiment group, right? Figure it out. And it's gotta be cheap though. Make it fast and cheap. And that's my last point here. Attributes of successful innovation. If it's expensive experimentation, you generally don't learn from it. NASA is trying to do expensive experimentation. I don't think NASA is gonna succeed very well. If I were advising them, I'd tell them go cheaper. 
You need cheap experiments to learn better, even if it's a failure. And here's the problem if you're not doing any experimentation. If we only focus on breakthrough and this notion of evolutionary sustained innovations, the problem is if we don't do revolutionary, we don't do this experiment, right? We lost this opportunity to experiment, and that's the problem. And the other problem is breakthrough is expensive. Okay? Same success rates, right? 30% at best, uh, but we lose this notion of experimentation. And that's what I think that might be happening for our military. Right? For our military, we often say that, um, if you heard General Colin Powell's talk, right, he said we don't have a, a zero defects army anymore. Right? He told you about his failures as second lieutenant. Right? He lost a weapon during one of these field exercises. His company commander chewed him out, but they eventually found the weapon. That's his notion of, yeah, we're no longer a zero defects uh, military. I would agree with that. The problem is I want to be better than a zero defects, a no zero defects army. I want to be an experimenting army. I, I want to be an army that, that is doing all this, this stuff in red and this stuff in blue. Okay. Uh, big thanks to uh, Hatari and the Torcon crew uh, for inviting me here. Uh, having a Fed speak is uh, for me. It's uh, it's I enjoy giving the talks. Hopefully, my audience is primarily to be military leaders. But hopefully, this framework also gives you this notion of the experimentation that you're doing as hackers. I encourage it uh, because, as Lance mentioned, right, we're we're trying to get more hackers into cyber defense, uh, even for the military. Right, Mudge Mudge Zacco. Uh, works a lot. It's amazing. I work in the Army Cyber Institute. Again, I, I told you I was a newbie. Uh, we, they always have these guest lectures, right? Uh, what was introduced to me in the email was, oh, we have this famous hacker coming to give a talk to us. Uh, come, everyone come down to the conference room and hear him. Okay, so I learned, okay, it's Mudge Zacco. I have no idea who he is. It's not until afterwards, right? Okay, I researched who Mudge Zacco was. Holy smokes, he is not a famous hacker. He's the hacker, right? The law, uh, yeah, so he's the guy who breaks into the NSA for the first time. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, for me, it's exciting working in this space. I'm new to it. Uh, I am very thankful for being in conferences like these because my benefit is not from giving a talk. Uh, almost every conference I go to, I find at least, at least one speaker that I really want to write a paper with because the ideas that they bring out, it's, it blows my mind, right? Because it's nothing the military's talking about. It's the first time I'm hearing about it. I'm just starting to go through a lot of these SANS courses. So for me, a lot of the terminology is all new. Uh, so I'm a, a neophyte, uh, an admitted neophyte. But again, look at just some of these talks, right? Stuff that happened today. A lot of this is uh, disruptive revolutionary innovation right, this afternoon. Again, some of it's sustaining evolutionary, some might be breakthrough, but most of this stuff is in the red, red, red box. Right? And that's what I'm encouraging. That's why I'm, I'm encouraging our military leaders to start thinking. Uh, leverage the expertise, leverage disruptive thoughts, leverage the revolutionary, right? Leverage the revolution, right? The revolution is with the, uh, what's this? Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that. When Lance, Lance said, hashtag is the pound, I'm using the pound sign now as, as a, a revolutionary sign. <laughs> yeah. revolution. Start a revolution for our military, this is our belief on. Uh, and with that, uh, I only have a minute left, and so why don't I disconnect and let the uh, next speaker set up? Uh, but if you have a question, I can field that while, while we're, we're doing that transition here. Does anyone have any, have any questions? I'll, I'll be here for the rest of the conference. I'll be here the rest of today and tomorrow trying to gain, again, more of the wealth of knowledge on disruptive innovations taking place in cyber defense. The great thing, again, I, I didn't mention was another thing that I've learned from, from attending these conferences is that... Uh, Right, Lance mentioned this, right? We hackers not only try to break things, but we also try to give back to the community. What I've learned is that um, uh, from these talks that I hear, not only do the hackers tell me how they broke it, right? How they got into the NSA, how they got into Target, things like that. But almost always, they'll always come at the very end. Okay, if Target or if Company X had done this one little thing, I would have gone to a different company. I would have gone to a different site. When I hear that, right, that's what sparks me, right? They had done this little thing. Right? Everyone hear any uh, Deviant Olam talk? Physical pen testing, right? Deviant Olam, I show his video on day one of my lessons now, when I, when I give my classes, because to me, cybersecurity was too abstract. So I play Deviant Olam's uh, physical pen testing, right? Because Deviant Olam not only tells you, oh, he laughs, right? I, I broke into this door so easily, I broke into this elevator so easily, but he gives you the 10 second clip that says, 
if he had done this one thing, if he had gone to Lowe's or Home Depot and bought these jam tins for 50 cents, I wouldn't have taken this door apart, right? So when you hear that, that to me is a revolutionary innovation, right? Pound sign, revolutionary innovation. And that's why, that's why I love coming to this conference and gaining your insights as hackers and, uh, and hopefully, now that you know this framework, you guys are doing, you guys and gals, right? You guys and gals are doing disruptive innovation. You guys are doing re revolutionary innovation. Hopefully it's for the defensive side, but even when you expose that uh, weakness on the offensive side, you give me that little trick, that little twist that tells me, okay, if you've done this, I would've gone somewhere else. And that's what I like hearing. And that's why I wanna promote to our military, right? More of this uh, little tricks, like, hey, do this. Uh, our defense is much better. So thank you very much. <laughs>